a new record in gold. And we have the perfect guest, Jeffrey Christian of CPM Group, and they have just released their 2024 gold yearbook on Thursday. So the stars are aligning for us today, my friends. Hello, and welcome to the Northern Miner Podcast. My name is Adrian Pocabelli, and it continues to be incredibly interesting out there. One of the big stories headline out of Reuters, miners lift Toronto market to new record high. So TSX now at 22,107 points. Material sector climbs 2.8% as gold rises. But the questions remain here on how the stocks are performing relative to the metal. And it kind of reminds me of the last couple of bull runs. You know, I always go back to when I first got interested in this business around 2009 and the first stock that I thought, you know, should be bought was Agnico Eagle at $72. And if I just do a quick search, we're probably at something like, if I had to guess, yeah, we're at $61 with gold at $2,283 now as I speak to you. So it's been a very tough time. Like really, we haven't even, again, with record gold prices and a significant move, Agnico Eagle hasn't even broken the April 2022 highs of $65.80. And back in 2020, we were as high as $82, again, just at $61.30. So it remains an open question whether the stocks will participate. And finally, though, to be fair to Agnico, it's coming off a low on February 9th of $46.62. So from $46 to $61, is still a 30% move. So that has to be recognized here. So it hasn't been insignificant move in the miners, but when you zoom out, it doesn't look like the gold chart, is what I'm trying to tell you. here. It does not look like the gold chart. I mean, you can go back to 2022, where it was a high of 65.80, and even 2020 when we hit 81.31, and then it's all the way back in 2010, we're at $82.93, and now we're at 61. So You could call it a consolidation. I guess we'll see what happens there. Just taking a quick look at GDX, which is, of course, the large cap gold miners, just to see what's happening here in the last six months. February 28th, we hit a low of 2578, which is actually the lowest of the last six months. And that was a bit of a double bottom, interestingly, because in October, we also hit $26.30. So we hit a double bottom interestingly, in GDX. So maybe a good sign. And currently we're at $32 on, again, the Van Eck Gold Miners ETF, breaking the $31 level that we saw in December. We also have a $32 level in July of 2023. Looks like we're going to break out of this thing. The question really is, when you look at these charts, is, is this the end of the downtrend? That is really what this is coming to. Are we going to stop seeing you know, lower highs. You know, we have seen, you know, higher lows, admittedly, and it's almost like we have one of those, I think you'd call it a wedge pattern, where the it's like a triangle that's sideways, and it's getting tighter and tighter, and it looks like it broke to the upside. So that is GDX. Now, turning to GDXJ, it's a very similar story. It looks almost identical. And the low in March was at $31.20, and currently we're at $39.20. So basically, we've seen, I would say, a pretty fast move, about a month. We have seen a 30% move in the stocks. So despite all of the long-term questions, we have to grant In the short term, you can't complain with a percent a day. That's looking pretty good. And again, if we zoom out, it does look like a little bit like perhaps, and I'm not a technician here, but perhaps a wedge that has broken to the upside. So that is what's happening with your ETFs. Of course, GDXJ being the juniors. Now, just finally turning to Newmont, I mean, we're at $36.43, coming off a low of $29.87. So let's call it only a 20% move. So underperforming with Newmont and Barrick on February 14th, we hit $14, a near-term low, and currently we're at $16.86. I mean, it looks like not even 20%. So Barrick and Newmont are the laggards, interestingly. Very interestingly. 
I may have to call up Cam Curry to get some more insights. So that is what is going on in the gold market, which I would say is really getting some attention. Just going around the world here, some of the headlines, I had to highlight a couple of follow-ups. The International Seabed Authority website is not ideal. We've been talking about deep sea mining. I think the conference ended on March 29th. As far as I could understand, I didn't see like a big headline coming out or press release saying, this is what we figured out. It's almost like all those stories that were coming out at the beginning of the conference is basically what we're left with from a news perspective, which I find kind of strange. I do have a couple of follow-ups that I found that I thought were interesting, almost from a cultural perspective. Nature, the very famous scientific journal, they put out an editorial on March 26, deep sea mining plans should not be rushed with a subheadline, why are companies and governments determined to start commercial scale mining for rare metals when so little is known about its wider impacts? Well, I think there's actually a very clear answer to that, which is economics and money. Indeed. And it says here as well that the conference ended on March 29th. And just to scroll down a bit, uh, they did some research, which was quite interesting. Last month, the ISA, the International Seabed Authority, published the latest draft of its mining regulations text. This ran to 225 pages, and researchers and conservation groups were alarmed to see that, unlike previous drafts, it incorporated proposals that would speed up the process for issuing commercial permits, and it also weakened environmental protections. And a couple of paragraphs lower, furthermore, in an earlier version of the text, there was a proposal to include measures to protect rare or fragile ecosystems, but this wording is not in the latest draft. And I would just want to re echo. My thoughts from last week when I saw the 60 Minutes report and what is actually taking place on the bottom of the sea from an environmental perspective. Again, words can be deceiving. I remember Gerard Barron, the CEO of the metals company, describing this as kind of an innocent little picking up of little pieces of, you know, these golf balls, so to speak, these nodules off the bottom of the sea as if you were, you know, collecting rocks on the beach. What I saw was an industrial scale vacuum cleaner. And that is not innocently picking up rocks off the beach. So I'm a lot more sympathetic to the environmental side of this after actually watching that video. You know, again, it's back to this idea of the power of images. It's just a really clear example for me. Now, technically, just finally on this point, it does look like you could actually pick up each of these nodules individually. Maybe that's not seen as economic or as profitable. And to me, just from my non-expert position, but just from following this story, hearing what people have to say, trying to be as objective as I can, the issue isn't, for me, whether deep sea mining should be done. I think the case can be made for it. But it's all about how it is done. Again, and maybe I'm mistaken here. I actually reached out to Gerard Barron. I never got a response on LinkedIn. But I would love to have Gerard Barron back on the program to help answer these questions. Because to me, it's all about how it's being done. Am I mistaken in seeing it as an industrial scale vacuum cleaner? Because again, if that's the case, that is a completely different story than picking up rocks off the beach, so to speak. Right. So that is kind of where I'm left at the end of this. And I was a little surprised that the meeting ended and they didn't put out a press release saying what they had accomplished. It seems kind of strange to me. And, you know, just back to nature here for a second, to that point of it being hard to get information, I mean, nature's singing a similar song. Quote, proposing changes to draft text is normal in a negotiation, but failing to publicly identify who is proposing them is not. It is damaging to trust and a risk to reaching an outcome in which all parties are happy. Questions are rightly being asked of the leadership of the ISA Secretariat, which organizes meetings and is responsible for producing and distributing texts, as well as the leadership of the ISA's governing council. Nature has reached out to the Secretariat with questions, but no response was received by the time this editorial went to press. We urge the ISA to respond, engage, and explain. And I think that would help everybody. So interesting to see nature feeling kind of, you know, left like they're lacking information. 
That is how I feel as well. Now, continuing on this topic, we saw that the United States, China, and Russia are very aggressively looking to get permits to start mining in the high seas, international waters. We have a story here on RFI, a French news website, India dives into deep sea mining as it battles for a clean future. And really interestingly, we have a few stories of India going into mining. And here's the subheadline: India hopes to widen an undersea hunt for limitless metals that hold the key to clean energy. The moves come amid warnings from France and others that harvesting the seas could devastate ecosystems. So India is taking a more aggressive role. And just a few more headlines on India that I wanted to share here. So that's just the latest on deep sea mining. I'm kind of looking to see if we get any kind of follow up. So let's continue on India. Also a headline. This is Reuters on mining.com. India to send teams to Chile seeking lithium and copper assets. And don't forget, we saw that story last week in the Economic Times, where India's mine ministry was saying, you know, Africa is a really exciting place for us. You know, a week after, both the U.S. and China had stories about how they were excited about Africa. So now we have a story from Reuters that India is sending teams to Chile to seek lithium and copper assets. And here's a quote from an unnamed government source in the article, quote, we are interested in buying assets. We are trying to facilitate private and government-owned companies to acquire assets in other countries as well. And that is the takeaway here, that India is really on the hunt for critical minerals as well. And just a follow-up story on that, we have a headline out of Bloomberg News via mining.com that Indian billionaire Gautam Adani has kicked off a $1.2 billion Indian copper smelter. So. You know, headlines I'm seeing in the last couple of weeks is India really is trying to assert itself as a major player in this global race for critical minerals, quite interestingly. So continuing on on this kind of same theme, but from an American perspective, we got a headline out of Bloomberg News via mining.com. U.S. talks often with Congo's Jekka mines on cobalt and copper, official says. So Jekka mines is the state miner out of the DRC. So again, the headline, the U.S. is talking often with the Congo's state miner on cobalt and copper. So Jose Fernandez, the U.S. State Department's Undersecretary for Economic Growth, Energy, and the Environment, said in an interview this week that conversations with Jekka Mines on supply deals and potentially new mines or other projects are taking place on average every four to six weeks. The Mineral Security Partnership, or MSP, which we've discussed here a couple of months ago, a multinational collaboration of more than a dozen countries and the European Union to invest in a global supply chain announced a deal with Jekka Mines and Japan's Jogmec in February. That deal was a product of these conversations, Fernandez said. And just a couple of quotes here from Jose Fernandez, U.S. State Department Undersecretary for Economic Growth, Energy, and the Environment. Quote, be it China or anybody else, it's just not good to have one single supplier of anything. Host countries do not want to have an investment system where investors bring in their own workforce, do not clean up their environmental damage. They've experienced that, and that's not what they want. So clearly trying to take a dig at China, who has a reputation for doing this sort of thing. And then an interesting paragraph here, and we'll move on. Fernandez declined to comment on whether the U.S. government would seek to buy all or part of the Canadian miner First Quantum Zambian assets. First Quantum has been seeking fresh sources of cash amid an unrelated dispute with Panama's government that closed one of the company's key copper mines. So I believe we saw a story where they had Chinese buyers who were interested. Now the undersecretary is being asked if the U.S. government would seek to buy First Quantum's assets in Zambia, you know, to just highlight how important this has all gotten. And then from the other side, we have China is also trying to decentralize their supply chain. World's top aluminum producer sees raw material supply risk in Guinea. This is Bloomberg News via mining.com. Aluminum Corp of China said it sees, quote, relatively high and, quote, risk to supplies of bauxite from Guinea, highlighting its growing dependence on a single country for the raw material. The West African nation last year provided 70% of China's imports of bauxite, which is used to produce aluminum. That left Chalco, as the company is known, highly exposed to disruptions there. And we have a quote from Chalco who said in their annual results statement, quote, 
The company's bauxite mine in Guinea may experience fluctuations in supply due to local policy changes and frequent strikes, end quote. So you see there's concern as we deglobalize here on all sides about securing supply chains, which does seem to be inherently inflationary, doesn't it? When everybody is trying to do their own supply chain. Also in Africa, we were mentioning the new president of Senegal, We've also been following that story fairly closely, that Bazaru Diomai Fai had made statements about, you know, reducing the French influence, changing the currency, which I looked up on ChatGPT, by the way, which is the West African CFA franc. The currency is used by several countries in West Africa and is pegged to the euro. Probably how that works, and I don't know, is I'm assuming... These countries send their natural resources that France buys for CFA francs. I am guessing, but I am not positive on that. That is just speculation on my part. So they are seeking to remove the French influence, even though it was a democratic election. This 44-year-old candidate won, Zero Diame Fai won on really a anti-neo-colonial you know, neo-colonial agenda, I think is how it's received real or not. And here's a headline. Baziru Diame Fai aims to renegotiate contracts with oil giants BP, Cosmos, and Woodside. And this was part of the campaign. So now following up on campaign promises, which is interesting. And finally on this, Emmanuel Macron, this was in Le Monde, a French newspaper, French President Macron tells Senegalese president-elect France wants to, quote, intensify partnership. And I was seeing these African news YouTube channels, and a lot of skepticism with Macron wanting to, quote-unquote, intensify the partnership. There is just a deep skepticism. So interesting developments. And finally, before we turn to Terry Braun of SRK Consulting for this week's CEO Spotlight, just an announcement and congratulations to this year's Young Mining Professionals of the Year. Scott Birdhull of Whitehorse in Canada and Ella Cullen of Lisbon, Portugal, won the Young Mining Professionals Awards for 2024. So if you want to find that, just go to northernminer.com and you can read the whole story of these two outstanding figures under the age of 40 who have demonstrated exceptional leadership skills and innovative thinking for their companies and shareholders. Of course, Ella Cullen won the Ira Thomas Award and Scott Burdell won the Peter Monk Award. So a big congratulations there and also the Canadian Mining Hall of Fame has opened their calls for nominations. If you want to find us online, you can find us at northernminer.com. You can find us on Twitter at Northern Miner and on Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube, where we also host these podcasts and wherever podcasts are available, including Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and SoundCloud. And with that, let's turn to Terry Braun of SRK Consulting for this week's CEO Spotlight. Joining us today, I'm very pleased to welcome to this week's CEO Spotlight, Terry Braun, Managing Practice Leader of SRK Consulting in North America. Terry, welcome to the show. Thank you, Adrian. Pleasure to have this time with you. Well, it's great to have you. I've been seeing SRK in the Northern Miner newspaper since I started way back in 2012. So it's wonderful to talk to the organization in person here and to have you on the program. It is a very well-known name in the mining industry. So tell us, we have this huge critical minerals debate going on and discussion uh, globally. It's become, you could argue, a central issue of governments around the world, the supply chain, the economy. How is SRK approaching this whole critical minerals discussion? Well, Adrian, SRK is one of several international technical consulting firms that have worked in this field before it became the hot critical materials or critical minerals conversation it is today. You know, our work works through the life cycle, whether it becomes through identification, exploration, development, operations, or closure of these facilities. We work with investors who are interested in exposure to this part of the supply chain. And SRK's role, we're seeing not just working with the financial folks looking to deploy capital in this space or with developers who are looking to seek the capital. We're also working with the original equipment manufacturers who are looking to secure responsible sourced raw materials or refined materials for their products. It's a great space to be in. And I have to say, we see similar dimensions in other commodities. When it comes to this critical mineral space, the fact there's so much geopolitical movement towards securing 
domestic or close to domestic type of supply chains for copper, rare earths, the electric green, or however that the U.S. Department of Energy defines, or what we see coming out of Europe or Australia. It is a different kind of game right now with this new layer, Adrian. Okay, fascinating. And so just in terms of like the practical application here, like what is it that you guys are doing? Are you consulting? I mean, I know SRK for drilling. Uh, What kind of applications are you doing? You know, put some flesh on the bone here for us in terms of what you're doing. Certainly, we are boots on the ground, early stage of helping doing targeting or developing exploration potential for some of our clients. I think the other interesting part here is, for me, is we move into, say, the lithium brine space. We're starting to see the combination of different types of sciences that help us define mineral resources and reserves, where we have spodumene and lithium space, or hard rock type deposit, which we can develop more conventionally using conventional mining methods, conventional resource geology estimates and conventional metallurgical testing. Now we're pivoting into a space where the folks that are in the either direct lithium extraction technology world or in the more conventional solar evaporation type systems or a combination of both, taking our hydrogeologists, taking our mine planners, taking our mineral economist folks, and taking something from potential through the stages of development and helping our clients raise sustainable funds to build and operate the project. And you're mentioning that the Mountain Pass mine, you know, famously in my own mind, you know, Molly Corp had issues, you know, back, you know, I guess it was probably in the 2010s to 2012s when we had the big kind of rare earth stock boom, uh, at least in, in some of the stocks there. Tell us how things have changed over at Mountain Pass. I think probably a lot of people have actually heard of that mine. It was kind of a big rare earth mine and it's a storied project. Adrian, yeah, indeed. In fact, Malikor is the original owner and operator of the Mountain Pass mine. I got to say, Adrian, of all the rare earth mines, and by the way, or the rare earth materials or minerals, you know, rare earths are common on most of these critical materials type of lists. And Mountain Pass is one of the early producers of more or less the lighter rare earths from the cerium to the lanthanum to the neodymium, the praseodymium. And, and Malikor did quite well up through the late 90s, being strongly differentiated and being one of the A, for its quality and its production rate, and its ability to deliver reliably. And as you hinted at, the history of Molycor, they ran into operational difficulties. They ran the market itself, I think, also affected their performance. And around 2000, almost 25 years ago, they stopped production. They were refloated in 2008, and SRK helped Molycor go back to the market. There was a series of uh, investors that took the project offline, worked through the development process, worked through a new plan to restore processed oxide production or or separations of the rare earth elements. And that work really hit its peak in 2008 with the IPO listing on the New York Stock Exchange, at which point I was preparing for that listing. The actual listing was in 2010, 2011. And with the gain of that capital and with the appetite for restoring production of domestic rare earths, the project got up and going. A lot of things happened as though they had a proven track record. They ran into technical challenges with the rebuild and redeployment of the asset. In 2015, it was over for Molycor 2.0. And what's happened since, after some restructuring and some reorganization, the property is now owned by MP Materials and it's up and running again. It is producing the same rare earth concentrates from light until, say, up through even samarium rare earth oxides. And here we are watching an operator also move to, now they've produced concentrates for the vet part of the last three or four years, and SRK is helping work through some of their public disclosures as they continue to restore the individual production. So it's kind of a, a rise, a fall, a rise, a fall, and now we're rising again in a much different landscape. Now, the rare earth market, Mountain Pass also stands out because while we have the resources here in the U.S. to produce these particular rare earths or critical minerals, we're in the process of restoring capability of separating and producing individual rare earth oxides. We rely on other supply chains or downstream processing to do the metallurgical work to produce the refined products. And that balance really is still out of balance on the rare earth side with over 95% of our rare earth elements, rural processing capabilities are in Asia. Nonetheless, it's a good story to see that technology is back and we are restoring that element of our domestic supply chain. And it's a great deposit. It's right off of Interstate 15, exit 281. When you think about some of these other more distant locations where we're finding these critical minerals, we are building infrastructure, perhaps hundreds of kilometers in power and water utilities in order to bring these resources, to develop them, to bring them to the market. And Mountain Pass is an hour south of Las Vegas, Adrian. And so SRK has a role then in bringing this back. Is that correct? 
Yeah, certainly the technology side of what MP Materials is working through now is we have a review capacity working with them. I think the other big takeaway where we help work with clients around the world is it is about grade uh, when it comes to these rare earth critical minerals, and it's about process technology. And one of the value propositions that we recognized in working with MP Materials is, is they do understand the metallurgy of their deposit. They have a couple of decades of track record of understanding frequency occurrence and how to crush, mill, grind, separate. But every deposit needs time, in my mind, in the industrial mineral space and the rare earth space. That metallurgical challenge and you need enough grade to make that metallurgy pay. So what I have to say, Adrian, is when we look at some of these more hard rock oriented complex mineralogy, rare critical minerals, there is a challenge that a small group of folks, it's a combination of research folks, a combination of industry, and generally you're being sure you've got experienced expertise that has some application to every, any given site's challenge. We have a few folks in-house. Uh, we also have a great network. And in fact, I have to say SRK, as well as other consulting firms, do rely on a handful of real strong metallurgical practitioners to make sure that we understand the uncertainty should a project be able to move through the development pipeline and that we can solve the metallurgical challenge or we understand the metallurgical challenges. Indeed, it is central to this whole rare earth discussion. As you point out, you know, 95% of the processing happening in China. Now, in terms of the sourcing of these minerals, tell us about that. Like, what are some of the big challenges you're seeing from your perspective? Well, I think when we look at the ESG frameworks, which well, there's an abundance of these individual framework standards and guidelines. If I just stay at the level of the framework of responsible sourcing of materials or a responsible business that's producing those materials, or finally, if I'm the responsible financier of investor from an investment thesis saying I want to deploy capital in means that develop resources in a responsible ESG broad conformant way. So when I go back to thinking about the rare earth discussion, you know, the idea that a lot of rare earths end up in magnets. So we find there are car manufacturers or wind farms that are looking for the REO type magnets, the Samaria cobalts, the NIB magnets. What I find in my experience with SRK is that we've got this responsible, more the car manufacturers coming in or the energy companies that want to know that not only that the resource is there and that the metallurgy is understood, but the water aspect, the air aspect, the social aspect, whatever criteria, whatever sub framework that these responsible sourcing or ESG frameworks offer, that they adhere or can conform to those standards. And what that means, Adrian, is that you know whether you're in the middle of Western Australia or whether you're in the heart of Africa or you're in some remote part of Latin America, say in the the Puna region where a lot of lithium deposits are found, we're working much closer with indigenous type ownership or stakeholders, I should say, where particularly I could give the example of the lithium back to Argentina. The fact that we are pumping or handling or would be handling a high brine, non-potable water, and yet should we go forward to successful extraction, we've got to take into account as we exploit that brine resource that we've got to understand the ripple effects towards lowering of the water table perhaps at distance and that might affect indigenous communities. I think we've seen somewhere on the sourcing side here in the States, again, that 90 some odd percent of a lot of these critical minerals are either within or within 35 miles of an indigenous community or stakeholder. And we're seeing these stories of how responsible sourcing from the automotive manufacturers or how the responsible businesses are presenting themselves. I could think of the Factor Pass project in Nevada, which SRK has had some involvement in, but having a look at the support or the level of engagement that GM has given as well as the Department of Energy, if this conditional loan goes through, as well as the high profile type of dialogue that Factor Pass has had to have with local communities. So the sourcing conversation has this dimension where we are always working in remote regions. We're working towards a greener, responsible type development outcome. And it has changed how we start the conversations and how we SRK advise our clients as we understand where their priorities and where their needs are and their investment thesis within this sourcing framework. Okay, excellent. So if I'm a mining executive and I'm listening to this conversation and I'm thinking SRK might be able to help me, what should I do? My role in SRK Consulting here in North America, uh, I do connect the dots with our staff and our resources here. We have 
invested in a platform online with www.srk.com that will take you regionally based on where you're accessing the site to our pool of practitioners. That's probably our best tool. We love our presence on LinkedIn. You can find us there. And if there's a little link at the bottom of this little note here, I'm happy to route traffic where it might need to go just to see if we can get the right people who might be interested in exploring these critical minerals and how SRK might support them. Excellent. We will leave a link in the show notes. Terry Braun, Managing Practice Leader of SRK Consulting in North America. Thank you for joining us on this week's CEO Spotlight. My pleasure, Adrian. All the best. And thank you once again to SRK Consulting for sponsoring this week's episode of the Northern Miner Podcast, Turning to the News. I'm going to start with Indonesia, but there's a quick story in the FT that I wanted to highlight, which came out over the weekend. Indonesia to accelerate nickel output despite low global prices. And of course, we've been following the nickel story quite closely here. And I just wanted to highlight a couple of parts of this article. Indonesia will press on with plans to expand nickel output despite a supply glut that is forcing rivals to shut down mines as the world's top producer aims to keep prices low and protect long-term demand for the metal crucial to electric car batteries, a senior government official has said. So the government of Indonesia is saying the reason why we're flooding the market has everything to do with protecting long-term demand for nickel and nothing to do with trying to take over the nickel market. So, you know, to our earlier discussion on words and images, I would argue in this case, words can be a little bit deceptive. And I have a quote from Septian Herio Seto, the deputy coordinating minister for investment and mining, who said, quote, we don't see any reason why we should not expand production of nickel for battery materials, Seto told the Financial Times. What we want to achieve is price equilibrium. The responsibility for us as the biggest nickel producer is to supply enough nickel so that the EV transition can progress smoothly, end quote. And finally, the FT said the surge in low-cost nickel supply from Indonesia will wipe out rivals in the next few years, the head of French miner Aramet warned last month. Australia's Wailu Metals is shutting down nickel mines in Western Australia, while BHP has said it is considering the closure of some nickel operations. So I don't think that's huge news for us. Okay, we've kind of determined this already, but here's the added information that I want to bring into it. A few paragraphs down in this FT article, car makers such as China's BYD have announced plans to establish manufacturing operations in the country. And I think that's what it comes down to. You know, a lot of these smelters and processing facilities are thought to be financed by Chinese investors. And here we have China's auto manufacturer, which is threatening the entire auto industry with its low prices, is now setting up shop basically right beside where all this cheap nickel is coming from. So if you're Indonesia, in a sense, you can't blame them. They're just going, okay, you want to set up your car industry here that could boom? We'll give you the cheap nickel and we're happy to keep flooding it. And it's just a win-win for us because we're going to own the nickel market We're going to put everybody else out of business and your cars are going to put everybody else out of business. It just seems like a perfect marriage, doesn't it? So we're kind of back to this idea that if you are at the beginning of the supply chain, if you own the processing facilities that are processing these metals, you can undercut the entire industry that you're in, whether it is solar panels, whether it is automobiles or whatever your industry is that requires metals. Now, continuing with Indonesia, we have a story here from Reuters on via mining.com. Freeport McMoran warns copper export ban could cost Indonesia $2 billion in lost revenue. So last year, Indonesia announced a ban on any exports of copper concentrate from the country. And the date was June of 2024, which always seems like a long ways away until it starts to approach here. So Freeport Indonesia has warned the Indonesian government that banning exports of copper concentrate in June could lead to a loss of $2 billion in revenues for Jakarta, a company official said on Thursday. Indonesia's export ban takes effect from June in an effort to force miners to invest in domestic smelting facilities, thus adding value to their products, boosting earnings from exports. Now, of course, Freeport McMoran owns the Grassberg mine, I believe one of the biggest gold copper mines in the world. So continuing on, Freeport Indonesia, controlled by mining giant Freeport McMoran, 
Though the Indonesian government is a majority shareholder, has called for the ban to be relaxed, as its Grezik smelter would not be operating at full capacity by June. And we have a quote from Chief Executive Tony Wenes, who said, quote, If we can't export, state revenues will drop by around $2 billion based on current prices. So that is the head of Freeport Indonesia. And then a few paragraphs down, Wenes has previously said that Freeport Indonesia would have to cut ore production by 40% this year if the government did not delay the ban. So flexing their muscles a little bit. And we have another story from Indonesian miner Aman, who asked for copper export ban delay as well. This is also Reuters via mining.com. Indonesia copper miner PT Aman Mineral International is in negotiations with the government to allow it to continue exporting copper concentrate beyond May 31st, its chief executive said on Wednesday, while predicting a surge in output this year. A man's appeal for relaxation of the export ban follows similar requests by copper miner Freeport Indonesia. And here is a quote from a man chief executive officer Alexander Ramley, who told a conference attended by media investors, quote, We are optimistic government will provide us with export restriction relaxation because it serves no one to restrict our exports because the government also relies on both Freeport and us for tax revenues, end quote. So again, it is all part of this larger trend where countries now want the processing of their minerals to be done in-country. And here's another story from Nigeria right along the same lines. This is Reuters via mining.com. Nigeria to grant mining licenses only to companies that process locally. And it says here, Nigeria will only grant new mining licenses to companies that present a plan on how minerals would be processed locally under new guidelines being developed, a government spokesman confirmed on Thursday. This signals a shift from Nigeria's decades-old policy of exporting raw materials as African governments take steps to extract more value from their solid mineral deposits. Now, interestingly, it says, To spur investment, Nigeria will offer investors incentives, including tax waivers for importing mining equipment, make it easier to secure electricity generation licenses, allow full repatriation of profits and boost security, Sigun Tamori, a spokesperson for Nigerian Minister of Solid Minerals Development, said. And here's a quote. In exchange, we have to review their plans for setting up a plant and how they would add value to the Nigerian economy. So, again, this is a global phenomenon. Continuing on, we are seeing quite a few stories now of smelters and processing facilities being built. For the first time, as I look at these stories, I'm starting to wonder if the world is going to go into oversupply at some point. I have a few stories along those lines. We already saw it in the intro with India. They're building a copper smelter. Here are a few more. MP Materials, who we just heard about in our CEO spotlight with SRK Consulting. MP Materials wins $58 million tax credit for Texas Rare Earth Magnet Factory to supply GM. And this is by Jackson Chen at the Northern Miner. MP Materials is being funded for $58 million. And it says the site in Fort Worth, Texas started construction two years ago. It's part of MP's $700 million plan to make neodymium iron boron magnets used in electric vehicles from minerals dug out of the company's mine in Mountain Pass, California. Commercial production of precursor materials is to start this summer with finished magnets by late next year, MP said on Monday. And further down, it says they already have a supply agreement with General Motors. Quite interesting. The Mountain Pass Mine is the country's only rare earth mine and separations facility. About 15% of the country's rare earths consumed annually is produced there. So very interesting development there. Also, NextSource applies to build graphite plant in Mauritius. This is by Cecilia Jamazmi on the Northern Miner. NextSource Materials has submitted an application to build a downstream battery anode facility to process graphite in the African island nation of Mauritius. The plant will have capacity to produce 3,600 tons of battery-grade graphite a year, increasing to 14,400 tons after this year, according to environmental impact assessment filings with the country's government. The filings didn't contain cost estimates. Now, of course... China is thought to own about 99% of the graphite processing, at least of synthetic graphite. So it doesn't specify here. It says battery grade graphite, but there is a difference. But even of the regular graphite, they still have a huge share of that industry. 
in terms of processing. So Next Source is looking to start a processing facility in Mauritius. Interestingly, continuing on the topic, Orano studying plan to build U.S. uranium enrichment plant. This is Reuters via mining.com. Again, I'm starting to think to myself, like, are we actually going to move into oversupply here at some point? It's the first time I've ever had that thought, I think, while hosting this show. A new feeling here, and this is Reuters via mining.com. French nuclear fuel specialist Orano is considering building a uranium enrichment facility in the United States, the group's chairman said on Wednesday, as the U.S. seeks to reduce its reliance on imports of the fuel from Russia. So a new nuclear enrichment plant potentially in the United States. And scrolling down a bit, Orano said in October it will invest in increasing production capacity at its uranium enrichment facility in southern France, largely to meet demand from its U.S. clients. Now, interesting, Orano itself mines uranium in Canada, Kazakhstan, and Niger, and has a single fuel enrichment facility in France, which accounts for 12% of global capacity. Rosatom holds a 43% share while European group Urenco accounts for 31%. So Rosatom, still the largest shareholder of Orano, interestingly. Continuing on, world's top uranium miner seeks to boost exports to the U.S. This is Bloomberg News via mining.com. And Kazakhstan, the world's largest uranium miner, is conducting, quote, active work, end quote, to boost exports of the metal to U.S. energy companies. The country's energy ministry said cooperation in the energy sector had been discussed at the meeting with U.S. Senator Stephen Daines on Tuesday. The nation already had contracts to supply uranium products until 2032, with firms including Southern Co, Constellation Energy, and Duke Energy, it said. All sorts of movement happening here. And interestingly, Chile has had issues with production of copper until this month. A staff writer on Mining.com wrote this story, Chile's mining production up 7.7% in February. And it says the country's top commodities, copper and lithium, were behind the overall production increase, according to data published by the National Institute of Statistics. Metal extraction grew by 5.5% on the back of rising copper output, which grew 10% to 420,000 tons. The country accounts for almost a quarter of the world's copper supply, equivalent to about 5.2 million tons a year. So quite interesting, Chile, we've had an ongoing story of how their production has had challenges, and now all of a sudden they are up 7.7% in the month of February. Another story, just a headline here, this is Reuters via mining.com. U.S. looks to reboot aluminum sector with a new smelter, and this would be built, as this column says, the U.S. is going to build its first primary aluminum smelter in 45 years. The Biden-Harris administration has awarded $500 million to Century Aluminum towards the construction of a new green low-carbon smelter. The aim is to halt what U.S. consumers such as Ford Motor Company and PepsiCo have described as a crisis in a sector that has shrunk from 19 to just four operating domestic plants over the last two decades. So we are moving on all fronts here. Now, just a couple of more headlines here. Aluminum price falls as weak China demand weighs on industrial metals. So aluminum struggling a bit. And you know what else was struggling is iron ore, which is around $100 per metric ton. So dropping significantly. Again, so a bit of a warning sign, it seems, from aluminum and iron ore. And also a headline here, this is Reuters via mining.com, Nippon Steel emphasizes its deep roots in the U.S. as it pursues U.S. steel deal. So, of course, Nippon Steel out of Japan, and there were concerns of them acquiring U.S. steel, particularly as these metals are seen as having a national security importance. So they are not giving up on it. And so it'll be interesting to see how it goes. Again, it's always seemed like a long shot to me that a Japanese company, despite being an ally, could take over U.S. Steel. Such an iconic name as well. But we shall see what happens. Those are your news stories. Now let's take a look at metal prices. And turning to metal prices, let's take a quick look at the bond market for context. The U.S. 10-year bond is yielding 4.35%. That is 0.12% higher than last week. So continuing its journey higher here, 
The UK 10-year gilt is yielding 4.07%, so back above 4%, and that is 0.12% higher than last week. And Italy's 10-year bond is yielding 3.78%, and that is 0.13% higher than last week. Turning to precious metals, gold is trading at $2,277.20 per ounce. That is $64 higher Then last week, silver is back above $25 at $25.70 per ounce. That is 84 cents higher than last week. Platinum is trading at $912.20 per ounce. That is $5 lower than last week. And palladium is trading at $1,002 even, and that is $29 lower than last week. Turning to industrial metals, copper is back above $4 at $4.05 per pound. That is six cents higher than last week. Iron ore is at $102.33 per metric ton. That is eight dollars lower than last week. Aluminum is unchanged at $1.06 per pound. Lead is at 92 cents per pound. That is a penny higher than last week. And nickel is trading at $7.52 per pound. That is 21 cents lower than last week, and tin is trading at $12.45 per pound. That is 13 cents lower than last week. Cobalt is unchanged at $12.95 per pound. Lithium is lower at $14.87 per kilogram. That is a dollar and one cent lower than last week. Uranium is at $88.50 per pound. That is $3.50 higher than last week. And zinc is lower at $1.11 per pound. That is two cents lower than last week. Zooming out, really gold stealing the show with silver tagging along, finally above $25. I think $26 is an important level technically. Silver showing signs of life, but really it's all about gold, it seems here. And all of the industrial metals, really kind of a mixed bag. Nothing too special other than iron ore, you know, hovering near $100 a metric ton, but really aluminum unchanged, copper back above $4, but to be fair, holding their own as the dollar strengthens. And those are your metal prices. Coming up, I'm very pleased to welcome back to the program Jeffrey Christian, managing partner at CPM Group. We discuss the magnificent rally in gold prices as of late and get Jeff's latest thoughts on what is happening and why it's happening, as well as the gold yearbook, where we go in depth into some of the really fascinating dynamics of the gold market, which are outlined in that book that is published by CPM Group each year. It was just released on Thursday, so very happy to have Jeff on the program to discuss it. I hope you enjoy the conversation, and I will see you on the other side. Joining us today, I'm very pleased to welcome back to the show Jeffrey Christian, managing partner at CPM Group on this fortuitous day when gold is hovering near $2,300. Jeff, welcome to the show. Yeah, it's good to be back. It's a very interesting day to be in the gold market, I guess. It sure is. I mean, what a year. What a move, really. And I guess before we get into your gold yearbook that you released last Thursday, so hot off the press. I'm just kind of curious on your thoughts on this gold move. Like, is it faster than you expected? Just give us your general thoughts. Yeah, we had been thinking that the gold price would rise sharply this year, and the idea of getting to $2,300 or even much higher was within the scope of what we expected. But it has moved a lot faster than we thought. We thought that the price of gold could be relatively restrained in the first half of this year and then see much higher prices in the second half of the year. We still see that pattern, but obviously at a much higher level. You know, what you've seen, I mean, you had three record intraday highs over the course of March, one last Thursday, the third last Thursday, and then today, April 1st, you've got another record high. You're seeing much stronger investment demand much earlier, a much more sanguine economic environment than one would otherwise expect. You know, we expected the sanguine economic environment 
in the first part of this year, which is why we thought that the price would kind of be mellow, strong, but not this strong. But you know, what you're finding is investors are pouring into gold, even though the economic environment looks halfway decent. Yeah, it's very interesting. And what do you attribute this to? If you had to guess, I mean, really, at the end of the day, it's probably a pretty hard question to answer, right, with mm-hmm. at least any kind of certainty. But is this an anticipation of rate cuts? You know, I was looking at seasonality. And again, your comprehensive view in, of gold in your yearbook there is quite impressive. Uh, what do you attribute this to? Well, there is clearly some seasonal strength to it, but it's investment demand. And it's, it's interesting. In, in order to sort of analyze the causes, look at the symptoms. And one of the symptoms that you're seeing in the financial system right now is record gold prices. Another one is a strong dollar and strong demand for U.S. treasuries. And some people are confounded by the idea that the dollar and gold could be strong at the same time. We're not because it's not unusual that this happens. So those symptoms, strong dollar, strong demand for treasury, strong demand for gold, strong gold prices, those symptoms point to a diagnosis that what you're seeing is a lot of investors looking at the world, relatively decent economic conditions, record high stock prices, time to cycle out of some of the riskier things like stocks and corporate bonds, because this probably is close to a cyclical peak economically, and time to move into capital preservation or relatively less risky assets. And those two assets that people always turn to are the dollar and gold, right? And treasuries are strong because central banks and investors around the world are not dumping treasuries. They're moving into treasuries because treasuries are the least risky interest-bearing asset you can have. You've done very well in stocks. You've done very well in corporate bonds and other sovereign debt over the last year or two, better than you expected because the economy has been stronger than you had expected. But now you're starting to get worried. On top of all of that is political concerns. And we have been saying, like last year, we were saying that we thought that the political environment would be much more hostile to the world in 2024 than it was in 2023, and that the political environment could be much more important in stimulating investment demand for gold this year and next year than it has been for several years. And that's clearly the case. You've got a lot of investors who are investing in gold and the dollar now because they're concerned about the political world domestically in many countries, especially the United States, but also in other countries ranging from Canada to Europe, to China, to Russia, to India, and internationally. So we think that there's a lot of political concerns stimulating investment cycling into gold and the dollar, as well as the idea that even though things look halfway decent or better than halfway decent economically right now, In six months, they may not. Exactly. It seems as if it is a kind of anticipation of risk off, to your point. And as you said in your yearbook, a kind of diversification out of paper assets. And it makes a lot of sense. I mean, if things don't seem like they're going to get any better than they are, then it kind of makes sense. Maybe time to diversify in case ideal conditions don't continue. You mentioned treasuries and government bonds. So... One of the things that really struck me, probably the visual actually that stood out the most, there were two actually, but one of the ones that stood out the most in your yearbook was the inverse relationship between treasury yields and the gold price. And do I have that right? It's not so much an inverse relationship as a lack of a relationship. I mean, the correlation between monthly changes in bond yields and gold prices is zero (laughs) for all intents and purposes. And that's one of the things that actually makes gold attractive to a lot of institutional investors and high net worth individuals and informed investors, you know, is you've got a diversification asset. It doesn't fall when bonds rise and rise when bonds fall. It trades pretty much independently over time. But if we go back, say, and I'm thinking of, say, 1980, 
didn't we see as yields went higher, didn't gold come down as a result of that? Yeah. And basically as yields came down over the next, you know, yeah. 30, 40 years, then we kind of saw, you know, gold go up in price. And that relates to probably the, the graphic that you were talking about. If you look at, look, 0% relationship over time, but that zero average masks periods of time when gold and treasury interest rates move in wildly opposite directions. And it masks times when they don't move in any fashion that's related to each other. And it reflects times when either interest rates and the gold price are rising together or falling together. And so you can disaggregate it and you can say, okay, when do we see a situation where you have interest rates high and that's a negative impact on gold? And the reality historically since 1968 is that it takes real inflation adjusted U.S. Treasury rates over 3% before investors say, oh, I can lock in an inflation adjusted 3% return on treasuries. Why do I need gold? So you can have a 5% increase in nominal interest rates over the last two years. But when you take into account 4% inflation, what you've seen is that real interest rates have gone from like negative 2% to positive 1%, which is far below that 3% real rate. And I don't know anybody, well, there are people out there who are saying we, we will see 3% real interest rates. But most people don't expect 3% real interest rates because if you have 3%, 4% inflation, that suggests 6 or 7% nominal interest rates. And most people don't think that nominal interest rates are going to get to 6 or 7% in this interest rate cycle. Now, if you go back to 1980, you had had an extended period of time of negative real interest rates from like 1975 to 1980. And that had led to and corresponded with very high inflation. So in early 1980, you had 14% inflation. And Paul Volcker had taken over the Fed in October of 79 and said, we have to target inflation, not interest rates. And he had jerked up interest rates to 21%. So you had a 7% real return on treasuries. And you could lock in a nominal 21% on treasuries in the first quarter of 1980. That had several effects. For the gold market, it caused a lot of people to say, okay, gold's gone from $200 to $800. Interest rates have gone from you know 8% to 21%. I think it's time to cash in my gold and go to cash and, and treasuries. The other thing that it did was it really whacked the stock market. And a third thing that it did is it threw us into what was then the deepest recession in the post-war period which lasted from 1980. It was actually two recessions back to back. They called it the double dip recession. There was a recession in 1980 and then another one in 81, 82. So yes, you can have a period of time like early 1980 where you have high interest rates causing investors to say, why am I in gold? But that was an extreme situation. Right now, yes, we've had a 5% increase in, in nominal interest rates, but nominal interest rates at five and a quarter percent are sort of like at the bottom of what nominal interest rates have been from 1968 to 2008. So you've seen a 5% increase in interest rates, but they're still very low levels on a historical basis. Very interesting. And while we're on the bond market and U.S. government bonds, one of the very interesting things I saw in your report is this idea that the debt is maybe not as big of an issue as it's often being made out to be, which I found quite surprising. And I think it's kind of the common sense reaction, let's call it this, the intuitive reaction, you might say, to these massive debts is that this is, you know, out of hand. I think in your presentation, you called it mega numeraphobia. Uh, you know, this almost... <laughs> I yeah. assume that means a fear of large numbers. Tell us your view on why these debts may not be as concerning as generally thought. Okay, there are two things to, to pay attention to. But first, I have to emphasize the debt is a problem. Fiscal deficits and debt-based spending on the part of the U.S. government, other governments, corporations, and consumers, that whole thing, there is too much debt 
in the world and we need to deal with it and get to a more sustainable financial balance. That said, there's a lot of extreme views that don't necessarily represent reality. And actually, one of the things that I was doing over the weekend was digging up in 1987. Uh, we had a gold price went from $280 to $500. The stock market collapsed. The new governor of the Federal Reserve Board, Alan Greenspan, he had replaced Paul Boker earlier in 87. When the stock market collapsed, people were saying, oh, you've got to lower interest rates. He looked at the economy. The Fed looked at the economy and said, no, the stock market dropped because of stock market stuff, not because of economic stuff. And we are not on the precipice of a recession. And there, I shouldn't lower interest rates. And he didn't. And we didn't go into a recession for four years. 1991 was the next recession. And it was very short and shallow. And the gold price went from $500 back down to about $380. So you saw this situation there. And it was representing the fact that, yes, we had a debt problem and a deficit problem. But the reason I was looking it up was because people have criticized my comment that I am being Panglossian, saying that the debt and deficits are not as big of a problem as people say. They are a problem, but you have to take it into context. In December of 1987, the new chairman of the Fed, Greenspan, went to Congress for the Humphrey Hawkins testimony. And in the question and answer period, he said debt and deficits are unsustainably high and the Congress and the administration have to do something to restrain debt and deficit. It's unsustainable at these levels. And at those levels, we probably had about $5 trillion worth of debt and we probably had about a 200 or $300 billion annual deficit. They were unsustainable then. 30 years later, we have, you know, $34 trillion in debt and a $1.4 trillion annual deficit. And people are saying this is unsustainable. Yeah, it is unsustainable, but that doesn't mean that it's not going to be sustained for an extended period of time because the financial system is set up such and structured such that you can manage these problems. So that's one of the reasons why we said that the debt is not that big of an issue. The other issue, which is more problematic in my mind, is that there are ways to reduce the federal debt that could be relatively painless, but there's no political will on the part of the Congress or the administration or either of the two ruling parties in the United States or the voters to undertake this to happen. We could fix this very easily in terms of the U.S., deficits and debt. The third thing which I should mention is, yes, we have a problem with the U.S. federal debt. It's now like 120, 123 percent of annual U.S. GDP. And this debt is U.S. treasuries, which again are considered the least risky interest-bearing investments you can have. If you look at it on a global basis, private and public debt is about 300 percent of global GDP. And the vast majority of that is not U.S. Treasury debt. So what you're seeing is investors are saying we do have a debt problem. It's not so much the U.S. federal debt. Well, that's a problem, but it's really a global debt problem. And as I look at this global debt problem and how it may cause economic problems and problems for my personal wealth, the solution is to get out of the more risky debt and move my money into treasuries, which is the least risky debt, and gold. And that's what you're seeing right now. Very interesting. And I suppose you would attribute that also to the central bank buying that we saw, I, I think you were saying in 2023, it was a major, if not the major factor in the gold market and that we had seen 16 years of consecutive net buying of gold by central banks. It sounded like 2024, you don't expect it to the same degree, perhaps. But in general, do you expect this trend to continue? Yes. Our expectation is that if you think about it on a longer term basis, 
let's assume that central banks buy maybe 10 million ounces a year for the next 10 years. So another 100 million ounces. That's in line with what we've seen over the last 10, 15 years. We saw a particularly large volume of gold purchased in 2023, but on a gross basis, we had 18 million ounces of gold bought by central banks, but you had 4 million ounces of gold sold. But of that 18 or 14, 7 million ounces was purchased from the domestic market in China by the People's Bank of China. So if you think about it on a net basis of 14 million ounces of net central bank gold buying last year, 7 million ounces of it or half of it was the People's Bank of China. Now, they were buying gold for their own purposes. But one of the reasons they were buying gold was that that 7 million ounces was part of a large volume of gold that had built up within the Chinese market in 2022, when private sector and sovereign wealth fund and institutional investor demand for gold was very weak. We saw like a 75% decline in gold demand in China between the first quarter of 2022, when the price had risen to a record price of, you know, 20. $2,140, I believe was the high, down to 1640 in November of 2022, as you saw this 75% decline in private investment demand in gold and private jewelry demand in gold. So there was a lot of gold built up in the Chinese market. And the People's Bank of China took the opportunity of that gold being available to buy it. They bought it our estimate between November and December of 2022 and all of 2023 into January of this year is that they bought more than 9 million ounces of a 10 million ounce surplus that was sloshing around in the Chinese market. That surplus is gone. We expect the People's Bank of China and other central banks to continue to buy gold, but with that stock of Chinese gold gone now. We assume that the Central Bank of China will be buying less gold this year because that gold's not readily available and the gold price is sharply higher. And, you know, the central banks in general don't like to chase the gold price higher. So they'll probably, you know, be buying less gold this year. That doesn't mean that they're going to be you know, buying a lot less gold. Our expectation, I think, is 10 or 12 million ounces for this year. So still pretty strong demand, which, again, as you said, that part of it is the surge into gold that we have seen on a global basis, private and central bank. Right. And interestingly, I mean, in the report, almost to your point, it sounds like there used to be more of a relationship or correlation, let's say, between lower gold prices and central bank buying, and that now this is starting to break down a bit. In a sense, they're willing to pay a little bit more than previously. And I just wonder, like, what do you attribute that to? Like, is it basically back to uncertainty in a general sense of, you know, there's geopolitical risk out there, even if it's more expensive? In a sense, maybe we don't have the luxury of kind of waiting it out for things to dial back. Well, you know, it's not just central banks, but investors, too. You know, we've seen an upward shift in the investment demand curve for gold, and we've seen an upward shift in the, the central bank demand for gold, by which we mean that there are more investors and central banks who are willing to pay higher prices and buy more gold at higher prices for a longer period of time than historically was the norm. And part of that is inflation, you know, and part of it is looking at markets with a realistic view. So, you know, there are central banks that were buying gold at $700, $800 in 2007, 2008. When the price went over 1000 they stopped buying. When the price came back down to 900 they bought. When the price went back up to 1000 they stopped. When the price stabilized around $1,200, $1,300, they started buying again. When the price went to $2,000, they stopped buying. When the price came down to $1,640 in the fourth quarter of 2022, there were any number of central banks that said, okay, it's not $1,200, $1,300, which is where we were comfortable buying in the past, but it's down 25% from where it was in January. So maybe $1,640 is the new base. And what we've seen is this 
decreased price sensitivity on the part of central banks and private investors. They're willing to buy more gold at higher prices, partly reflecting you know, the inflationary realities of the last 20, 30 years, but also partly reflecting the fundamental shifts that they've seen in the gold market where they're saying, you know, if I wait for $1,300, I may never buy another ounce of gold. If I'm willing to buy at 16 or 17 or 1800, I probably have a chance to buy gold. But at 2000, 2100, 2200, 2286 this morning, I'm not sure how much central bank buying is going on because there is some price sensitivity. Central banks, more than private investors, don't like to chase the price higher. And if you look at you know the last 15 years, what you've seen is that when investors bid the price up, central banks pull back on how much gold they buy. And then when investors get disillusioned because the price hasn't gone to $10,000 or whatever, then, you know, and they stop buying as much or they actually, you know, start selling some, the price comes down and central banks would buy. And that pattern of central banks buying on the dips has weakened to some extent. To what extent, we just don't know. You know, one of the very interesting things as well, and I can't recommend this report enough if people are interested in the gold market. One of the surprising things I saw, you know, relating to central bank and gold purchases and reserves was seeing China at number six for all of the attention that China gets and their gold buying and everything. There they are behind the U.S., Germany, Italy, France and Russia. And I think if you ask the general consumer of gold news, they wouldn't have thought that, you know, Italy or France necessarily have more gold than China. Well, Italy, France, the UK and Germany built up their gold reserves really after World War II. And it was a function of the Bretton Woods dollar gold standard. You use the dollar and you use gold for international trade and capital flow purposes. So if you look at any one of those countries, after World War II, they didn't have a lot of gold left in their central bank or treasury or ministry of finance reserves. But what happened was during that period of the 50s and 60s into 1971, when we got off the dollar gold standard, there was a lot of purchasing of goods in the United States and elsewhere in the world from the UK, Germany, France, and Italy. And those products were relatively cheap and very good quality. So you saw a lot of dollars flowing into those countries to pay for exports that people wanted around the world. And those dollars then would get recycled through the banking system. And a company that was making something in Italy would get dollars payment for its exports, it would then take those dollars to its bank and get lira. Its bank would turn those dollars into the central bank and the central bank would come to the US Treasury and say, hey, you're saying that the dollar is worth $35 per ounce. So here are my dollars, give me your gold. And as a result in the 50s and 60s, you saw this tremendous transfer of gold from the US Treasury to other central banks of exporting countries. Now, China and Russia, Russia is a special event, but China, Russia, India, a lot of other countries that are now buying gold over the last 15 years were not major exporters back then. So they didn't build up a lot of gold reserves. When you got to 1971 and we went off the dollar gold standard, Italy, Switzerland, Germany, France, the UK, other European countries, they had built up 80, 90, 95% of their monetary reserves were in gold because that's how you balance your trade and capital flow, right? And as the 70s and 80s and 90s progressed, those central banks said, we have far too much gold in our monetary reserves and not enough dollars if somebody is going to make a run, if the world says, oh, I think the Deutsche Mark or the, the Lira or the French franc is overvalued and they start selling our currencies, we need to defend and support that currency. 
In order to do that, we need to buy those currencies and we need U.S. dollars to pay for those currencies. If we have our reserves in gold and we need to defend our currency because it's being hammered by the market, we have to go into the relatively small, illiquid, and for banks, transparent gold market, sell our gold for U.S. dollars, and then we can use our dollars to buy our currencies and support them. So the banking community would see central banks coming, you know, because the first thing they had to do was sell their gold to raise dollars to support their currencies. So you would see times where a currency would be under pressure and that central bank would start selling gold. The commercial banks that were it was selling to saw them selling gold, knew that they were about to launch a program to defend their currency and their currency would stop falling long before they actually started buying it themselves. So they found that the central bank gold sales for dollars actually was a way to support your currency without actually buying your own currency back. So the result is that you had these central banks own a lot of gold. Now, Germany, France, and Italy, Germany and France have sold very little of their gold I don't think Italy has sold any of its gold. The United Kingdom sold half of its gold. It had 20 million ounces of gold in 1970s. It's down to about 10 million ounces now. Switzerland, which got up to about 97% of its reserves in gold, now has about 50% or less of its reserves in gold. They sold half of their gold over the period of time from 1999 to 2007. So you've seen some of those central banks reduce some of their gold. And at 50%, the UK and Switzerland are happy with their gold holdings. They're not selling any more. And other central banks have held on to it. So the fact that Germany, Italy, and France have more gold than China is a reflection of the residual of the old dollar gold standard. And the fact that China and Russia and India and other countries that were not major exporters back in the 50s and 60s are now buying gold reflects the fact that as they emerged economically, they built up a disproportionate amount of reserves in dollars. So they're diversifying their monetary reserves away from dollars into other currencies and gold, the same way that the major industrialized countries from the 50s and 60s earlier diversified their monetary reserves away from gold into the dollar and other currencies. You know, as I look at this top 15 central banks by gold holdings, and you mentioned the UK at 10, 10 million ounces, they don't even make the list. Saudi Arabia there is at 10.4, and Poland and Portugal and Uzbekistan, Turkey, Netherlands. You know, it's quite remarkable, the story with the UK there selling all their gold or selling a lot of their gold, not all their gold. Half, they sold half, yeah. Yeah. And I mean, you look at Italy here at 78, almost 79. It's remarkable to see these numbers. Now, what also surprised me, and I just have a couple of more questions. I know you're probably pressed for time today on such a landmark day. A couple of more questions, though. I was quite surprised at seeing the prominent place you put for Bitcoin in the report. Now, I think a lot of us are already familiar with the arguments, you know, the differences between you know, gold and Bitcoin, tangible, intangible. And I thought you kind of illustrated it fairly well. What I want to ask you, though, is not really what's the difference between gold and Bitcoin, but is the reason you put that there, are, are central bankers asking you about Bitcoin? Why did you feel the need to give such a prominent place for Bitcoin in this report? I think it was just a matter of geography, actually. You know, it's not that the central banks are looking at cryptocurrencies. They're very much concerned about the private cryptocurrencies. Uh, you know, you've seen trillions of dollars of investment money come and go, and it'll probably go again. So there's concern. You know, when the crypto market was less than a trillion dollars, which was three years ago, four years ago, central banks said, well, these things are probably going to blow up in investors' faces, but it's a relatively small problem. And we don't want to be blame for the the collapse that will come. So we're going to do nothing. And then the crypto markets grew into $3 trillion. 
at the end of 2022, I guess. And people thought central banks start saying, OK, at three trillion dollars, this could have a real measurable negative effect on our economy if this market collapses. It did collapse and it went from three trillion dollars down to about eight hundred billion dollars. So it lost more than two thirds of its value, the crypto market in a year. And central banks said, OK, this is bad. <laughs> you know, but now it's back up to about two point six. And they say, OK, but, you know, this is a this is a roller coaster here, but it's a significantly larger roller coaster. But the reason we put that discussion where it was, was because if you look at the outline of the report, it fit best in one of two places, either the review and outlook, which is up front, which is where we put it, or in the investment demand chapter, which was the second chapter in our book. You know, our book has review and outlook, investment demand, central bank, official transactions, supply, fabrication demand, market inventories, and stuff like prices. So when we had written that piece on gold and cryptos being the antithesis of each other for a separate report, but we wanted to do, include it in the gold year book, the question was, where do we put it? Do we put it at the end of the review and outlook as a special topic? Or do we put it in the investment demand section as a special topic? And we made the decision to put it at the end of the review and outlook because a lot of people only read that first chapter. <laughs> so its prominence in the report is, as I said, it's a matter of the geography of the outline of the report more than the importance that we assign to cryptocurrency. And just a word, you know, like one sentence on that, we think that stock market activity has a much more reductive effect on investment demand for gold than do cryptocurrencies. Cryptocurrencies, you know, even at $2.6 trillion are a fraction of the size of the gold market. And there are only a relatively small percentage of global investors who get involved in cryptocurrencies. But the stock market is several hundreds of trillions of dollars in stocks and quadrillions of dollars in stock market derivatives, that's a much bigger market and it's a much more universally seen market. So insofar as money gets distracted, if you will, from the gold market, more money gets distracted by the stock market by far than gets distracted by cryptocurrencies. But cryptocurrency investors are like gold investors. They see the world in crypto terms. So if something happens in the world, it's the crypto market that matters. Same way that a lot of gold investors see the world with gold tinted glasses. So anything that happens, oh, it must have to do with gold. In reality, gold and cryptos are relatively small portions of the global financial market. And usually when you see something happening in the global financial market, it doesn't have anything to do with gold or cryptos as being causes, they only have to do with gold and cryptos insofar as those broader financial issues affect investment demand for gold and cryptos. Okay, excellent. And thank you for clarifying that. Just as we wrap up then here, just on supply, uh, this is a mining podcast, you know, Northern <laughs> Miner newspaper. I'm curious, you know, I, I, the other chart that really stood out at me going from memory here, was gold production, you know, from mining, as far as I remember here. And it looked like from 1800 to now, it almost looked parabolic. It was this big curve going up. What is your sense on gold production? Because, of course, we hear Mark Brisso coming out and saying we don't quite have the same opportunities, mm -hmm. shall we say, in the ground. And it, there was a bit of a drop last year, wasn't there? Or at least there seems to yeah. be a slowing down. Could could you speak to that? Yeah. Okay. Well, first thing on the longer term, parabolic growth in gold mine production, that is a function of the industrial revolution. And you can look at corn production or copper production or steel production or automotive production and see that same kind of parabolic growth. So that's not unique to gold. Now, in terms of longer term things, I like to talk about how when I started in this business in 1978, 79, 80, global 
gold mine production was about 30 million ounces, and about 80% of it came from six mining houses in South Africa. You had one U.S. gold mining company, Homestake, and mine production in Australia and Canada and other countries was basically less than a million ounces a year. And the gold producers, who were primarily South African, always were saying in 1979, 1980, we can't grow production to meet current and future demand for gold. And they were right. They couldn't. But other people could. So you saw mine production go from 32 million ounces in 1980, about, up to, you know, what, 70, 80 million ounces nowadays. And all of that growth was from companies that were not gold mining companies in 1980. And I look at the world today and I say, okay, we've had a number of problems. Now, things have changed dramatically since 1980. And one of the things is that governments, local governments, and national governments seek a higher percentage of the profits that come from gold mining. And they also seek greater environmental and social protections from gold mining, because quite frankly, gold mining, as well as other hard rock mining and coal mining, have had significantly significant negative economic, environmental, social, and cultural, and political consequences over time. So it has become, the gold mining industry, like everything else, has come under greater regulatory control. Yeah. You know, automobiles in the 1960s, you had a metal steering column with a metal pipe pointed at the driver's heart. You didn't have seat belts. You didn't have airbags. You didn't have 30 mile an hour crash protection on your front bumper and your rear bumper. You know, everything has become more protected and more regulated, quite frankly, because it needed to be. Yeah, you had death trap automobiles and you had environmentally and socially destructive mining back then. And things have become more restricted and more regulated because despite what Ayn Rand wanted to believe, the reality was you didn't have a lot of noble businessmen. You had some noble businessmen, but you had a lot of other businessmen that said, hey, it's not illegal, so I'm going to do it. So you have seen greater pressures on growth of gold mining production. They're economic, political, and cultural, and social. They're not geologic. There's still a tremendous amount of gold that is known in reserves and resources that can be mined. And there are enormous portions of gold in resources and expected resources, especially in places like China and Eastern Russia. The problem for the world is that that gold will not be mined by Western mining companies that are listed on a stock exchange and report their reserves and resources. That gold will be mined by Chinese and Russian and other controlled governments that don't necessarily play with the Western capitalist system the way the Western capitalist system would like them to. And just finally on this <laughs> point, the all-in sustaining costs you have here at $1,339 seems pretty high in 2023. Like, I mean, yeah. it wasn't that long ago we were at, you know, $1,100 gold, it seems, and all of a sudden our all-in sustaining costs on average, 1339 mm -hmm. Do you have anything else to say just on the costs of mining gold? Well, the costs have gone up for a variety of reasons, and some of them have to do with inflation. Some of them have to do with increased regulatory issues and safety issues. And hey, you know, some of the costs have gone up because of long delayed capital investments in better equipment and newer equipment and stuff. But the bottom line is that the cost of production are affected by the price of gold. And the costs got very high 2008, 2010, when the gold price was very high. When the gold price came off after 2011, 2012, those costs were scaled back down to, like you said, about $1,100. As the gold price has risen over the last four or five years, mining companies have increased their costs. They've increased their general and administrative costs. They're spending more money on exploration. They're spending more money on development and pre-development work. And so the costs follow the price. If the price were to fall back to twelve dollars or $1,300, as it did 
in the period 2013 through 2019, you would see those costs come back off because the mining companies said, we can't sustain this. We have to scale back, right? So part of the increase to very high all in sustaining costs reflects the fact that the gold price has set new record annual averages for the last four years. You know? And it looks set to continue to do so for at least the next two years. So as the price has risen, mining companies have had more money to spend. It makes perfect sense to me. And thank you for the excellent explanation there. Now, as we finish here then, Jeff, first of all, I guess, do you have any final thoughts and where can people find your gold yearbook? I assume it's available to the public. Just any final thoughts and where to go? Well, the final thoughts are, as I look back at the conversation we've just had, I've taken simple questions and made it very complex, multivariate responses. And that's because that's the way the world is, you know, and there are a lot of people who want simple answers and there are a lot of people who will offer you simple answers and responses. And those are usually not accurate portrayals of what's going on. And it matters, you know, with finance and budget deficits and central bank activity and mine production and mining costs. This is a complex industry and a complex market, and it takes complex answers. And those complex answers can begin to be gotten by buying our gold yearbook. And you can do that at cpmgroup.com. We have a store section. So it's if you want, you can go cpmgroup.com forward slash store, and you can buy the gold yearbook. It's an ebook. It's a PDF. Once you buy it, you can download it, and you can start reading it, and you can start understanding some of the complexities that are hidden on more superficial explanations of what's going on. Well, I can't recommend it enough. At 280 pages there, I learned a ton about the gold market, and it's what we do here, you know, pretty regularly examining that market. So again, just go to CPM Group's website. Jeffrey Christian, Managing Partner of CPM Group, thank you for joining us and sharing your insights once again on the Northern Miner Podcast. I hope you enjoyed that extended interview with Jeffrey Christian, managing partner at CPM Group. It was very generous of Jeff to give his time as gold hit a new record. As I was asking him uh, before the interview, his phone must have been ringing off the hook, and indeed it was. So a big thank you again for making the time, as well a big thank you to SRK Consulting for sponsoring this week's episode. And thank you, dear listener joining us once again if you want to help out the podcast please leave us a review in the apple podcast directory share it with your friends and until next week take care